Today, we're talking with John from our mail care community. He's been online for six, seven, eight years, ever since he was first diagnosed, a relatively young man, diagnosed in his early 50s. And we're going to talk about how the women in his life have helped him along, problem solved, perhaps interfered with problems. Who knows? We're going to find out. John, welcome to our video. Tell us when you first sort of told your wife that you had prostate cancer. How did that play out? She was in the room with me. Well, actually, no. When I very, very first found out, I was being treated locally and it was kind of crappy. I just came home and said, okay, I've got the same thing. I killed my dad. She said, what are we going to do about it? I go, well, we're going to do everything the doctor tells us to do. I mean, we know what the outcome is going to be. If we don't, and it's going to, it's going to hasten it. Let's just do whatever the doctor says. I took it very, not emotionally, but very compartmentalized and very, I see things linearly and through the eyes. I see everything as a business transaction, really. It was just kind of weird. But I saw just another thing that I had to follow the rules to get done, which I can easily do. If they give me, tell me not to do something, I won't do it within reason. How involved did you bring in your wife on those choices? She's, first off, she's always been super supportive. Anything I want to do, we've got money set aside if we need to flee to Europe or India to get treatment. So she's very in tune to what's going on with me. Attends every appointment she can. In rural Western Arizona, healthcare is horrendous. From the hospital to any of your specialists, you're lucky if you find a good GP in the tri-state area. So we get all my, consequently, I get all my, my specialty work and my wife does her specialty stuff in Phoenix, which is a three hour drive. We're retired, not a big deal. My first doctor, and these are his exact words. I'm saying, okay, you said your prostate, we can just wait and see. And I'm like, no, it killed my dad. We'll remove it within the next two months. We really had it removed and then it became metastatic. And he said, time to get your affairs in order. In three years, I won't have you as a patient. I'm like, oh, crap. Went home, updated the will, made sure my wife and I do all the banking, how to pay the bills. And then, you know, we sat around and, and said, it just doesn't seem right. There's got to be more out there. And at the time, CTCA was, you know, running commercial. I said, let's go there. See what they say. First thing that my that guy I met there said was, was your doctor really old? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, because he's treating you like you did in the 70s. <laughs> he would have died if you had listened to this guy. So then I went to the CTCA, which is now City of Hope. And my wife and I went, and we went for an all-day appointment. It started at 8. We didn't walk out of there until 5. They did tests. They did scans. They did everything humanly possible to me. And we walked out going, oh, this is survivable. Total shift in, like a sea change, total shift in what one guy was telling me and what these people said. And I love that place. They're keeping me alive. So that's kind of how the first, first you know, real come to Jesus meeting was. And when you came to the mail care community, how did that inform a lot of what you were doing? I have a friend, a very good friend that is, she's blind. She hasn't always been blind, but she's, she, she was fully blind, I think probably two years ago. And as she was losing her sight, she said, what's been really helpful for me is a support group. And she goes, I know in your little town, they're not going to have one, but maybe try one online. And that's where I found mail care. And it's been wonderful. I get just different ideas and different aspects from people, different trains of thought. Mail has got some really good articles. And not all of them apply to me, but interesting ones I like, I read. And it's it has been, I didn't tell anybody for a year. My two daughters and my wife. And it was nobody's business. And finally, one of the girls said, you need to tell people. And you're not dying of cancer, you're living with it. And I went, wow, just totally twisted my head on that one. So I started telling people, and people were shocked. And I find that women are more receptive to that news than men. And I think it's because men know they could be next. My brother's shitting bricks. Because <laughs> we're BRCA2 positive. He's BRCA2 positive, but he doesn't have the cancer. So he's tested every three months. Because he's seen what early detection does. I have a friend that was diagnosed within a month of me, but his was advanced. He's passed away since then. And that tells me early detection did it for me. As soon as my dad died, I started being tested every six months. And that's what caught it early. How do you think that your wife responded to catching it early rather than not catching it at all? She's just, she's a rock. She's a tiny little five foot, 205 rock. 
And she's like, we'll do whatever you do. We'll spend whatever money we have. We'll wipe out our freaking retirement savings. That's what we need to do to keep you alive. And I'm like, and my opinion is I'm not going to leave her a poor widow. I'm under no circumstances. So I get what she's doing and I get what she's saying. And we've put ourselves in a good financial position. Should we need to do anything out of the ordinary? But she's just been supportive. She's not much of a crier. She's like, okay, we'll just fix this. It's like, like anything else, we'll fix. So she's been good about it. Let's you touched on a very good point around legacy and financial stability post your death. What conversations had you had with your wife around that? One of the daughters, one of the daughters is very financially aware. So she's volunteered. So I first you know, got my my finances have always really been in order. One going from a will to a trust, the bills are easily paid where it's we're in a really comfortable position in retirement rather than try and show my wife how to do it my daughter one of them is knows all my pin codes knows all how to get in my in my bank and, and so she'll be able to sit down with my wife when the time comes and i'm no longer able to do it and help her get bills paid in it's better for her to show her than me to show her because i just we both you know it is husband and wife you have butt heads so it's easier for her to show my wife and and death that'll be easy in fact there's, we have plans for one of whoever, whichever one survives the other one to move in with these people. Part of a big deal we've made involving the house and <laughs> some other things. But yeah, she's going to be fine. It's just not having me won't be fine. Yeah. You've mentioned uh, your daughters. It illustrates that you don't have to be a blood relative to be, you know, a loving and caring person. Oh, yeah. Can you describe a bit about the relationship between these people that you describe as your daughters? They used to work for me. And then we found we were getting more and more tied up with each other. We started going on little weekend trips together with my wife and his, and one of the girls is married to her husband. And then one of the other girls is single. And we started just starting to bond. And we started realizing that we were very much our own little clique in that we had the same beliefs. We hated the same kind of things. And it was almost like it was I don't say it meant to be. It was almost like we were put into each other's lives for a reason. And then, wait a minute, see if we can get this thing here. Wait a minute, outside. Oh, I may not be able to see it. The arrows are alive. Those are arrows. Those okay. are arrows. Okay, all, got it. The three of us went and got that matching tattoo. Huh. I, I had getting cancer, one getting ready to leave her husband, the other one had, had left her relationship. And it was just a tumultuous time for all of us. And so my wife doesn't have one of these, just me and the two girls do. And things turned out for everybody okay. It's just, it was a rough year for everybody. And so we we bonded. Is it fair to say that f- family as a, as a construct is really what you make out of it? It's not really about blood. It's about the people you love and who love you. Exactly. It's an odd concept. But, and a lot of, a lot of weird looks because 10, you know, eight years ago, I, I was much younger. It looks like a weird deal. I walk in with these two beautiful women that are clearly younger than me. And you can see people I look and talking, but that's it. We're family. We don't look the same, but we're family. And one of the granddaughters told me, she said, you can't always pick your family, but we pick you. I was like, wow. So yeah, I do everything with the girls, my wife and my, my brother. We talk about once a month. It's, we're not a stranger. Thing. He's just, he's way up there and I'm way down here. And my sister's just completely out of the picture. Do you feel comfortable with the family that you made as opposed to the family that hospital records may write down about? Yes, I do. I'm very comfortable with them. I mean, I've got all, oh, they're my go-tos. They're my ride or die. I had a suicide attempt. They came and freaking punched me out of it. That was when my testosterone tanked and everybody forgot to tell me. But uh, yeah, I can count on them for anything. You know, if I'm running down, they both live an hour in different directions. But, you know, I go to one's house and I do dad chores. I go to the other house and I bring stuff they need from town. It's just, it just works for us. And it's really strange, but it, it does. It works for us. And we're, even the in-laws and, and stuff and the uh, paternal families of these people embraced me and my wife. It's it's kind of nice. And, you know, it's always been me and my wife against the world. I mean, for years, for 25 years, it's been me and her against the world. And this just totally turned our world upside down. You know, if we had a problem, we'd just handle it on our own. 
you know, right. there was, we never asked for help. And then suddenly I find myself asking for help and assistance. And it's kind of vulnerable for me because I'm not that kind of person. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it works out just fine. And if I may ask, because it's hard to tell from the way you're lit and everything. Are you African-American? I'm Hispanic. Hispanic? Okay. Yeah, don't let that Irish name fool you. <laughs> Irish and Hispanic. <laughs> and Hispanic from uh, Caribbean or from Latin, uh, Latin America or Europe? Mexico. Mexico. Okay, yeah. good. Has that informed, has being of Mexican heritage informed any of the choices you made or the way doctors react or hospitals no. react or anything? Not at all. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just aware that a lot of underserved populations are really struggling with this because they don't go to the doctor regular and they, they need to get into that habit. I, I totally get that. And it's a shame in this country that even happens. Yeah. Well, why don't you speak a bit more about that as a man of Hispanic heritage? I find that, and I don't, I don't know if it's cultural, but like on the Hispanic side of my family, my mom always tried to treat us at home first. We just, we used to call it curandera, which in Spanish is a witch doctor, but it, it actually is a thing. And man, we always try to home remedy first and then film off to the doctor. So I'm not afraid of doctors. My wife's family was kind of, is, is different from that. So I've seen both sides of this going on and, and I'm very pro doctor. And pro pro farmer too of all the odd things in the world. When you have conversations now with your wife, seven eight years past her diagnosis and dealing with treatment, what what is the temperature of those conversations when you're discussing prostate cancer compared to when you were first diagnosed in the early years? A lot less angst. You know, once we started seeing the loop early on, seeing the loop run and Zytiga working so well, and then continue to work, really smooth things out. There wasn't so much worry on her part. I think she still gets nervous when I do my three-month checkup. I'm immune to it now because I know it's working. And there's something out there that, and like my doctor said, if we have five new, five new treatments every year and you live for five more years, that's 25 possibilities of some kind of success. And he goes, and he said, if one is the beginning and 10 is the end, you're at about three. So I, he says, they expect me to be, to move forward and, and keep moving forward. So really pleased with that. My wife's very pleased with that. And, you know, she gets, and she comes to the meetings and you can see she's a little bit nervous until the numbers come in. And an attitude, I think, helps a great deal. And it sounds like you have a wonderful attitude. Oh, yeah. That's what everybody says. I can be so happy because I'm not dead. <laughs> Can't be happy when you're dead. Do, do you find that people will say you seem so happy or you have great attitude, as I just said, but inside you there's a, a, a conversation that's saying wait these people don't know shit about me i'm feeling sad sometimes i feel like ending my life occasionally you know once etc you know to what extent do you keep the truth of your personal experience to yourself and not allowing people in yeah i personal details of everything it's just for my inner circle Lady, I went and get a pedicure and she's and she told one of her customers, she goes, This man makes the rest of my day great. He's always so up and funny and da 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 da. And I'm like, Well, how, how else should I be? I mean, once I retired, my whole world just improved. <laughs> and I was really a mean son of a bitch. I mean, I was fighting, I was just stupid shit. You shouldn't be doing it in your 50s. And as soon as I retired, my life slowed down. I didn't have to worry about this shit at work. And I eased out slowly. I did consulting for a couple of years. And my life is great. Like my doctor said, you're the healthiest sick man I've got. And, he goes, I wish, and then my MO said, I wish other people could see what weight loss and being in the gym every day does to them because it's a, it's, he said it's a game changer for me. Mm-hmm. And there's no science behind it that I know of. But yeah, I've got no reason but to be happy. And Oddly enough, a lot of that, I think, comes from not having biological children. I don't have this worry about people. I mean, I've got adult people that I call my daughters, but they're on their own. They have their own lives. They are self-sufficient. They're everything I'd want an older daughter to be. But not not having small children, I don't have this weird kind of micromanage like parents do. It's been very freeing for me. And we can do what we want when we want. My life is nothing but great. As we wind this down, I'm going to ask you to tell me five hints 
or five, you know, takeaways that the caregivers, the loved ones, suggestions on how they could do better with them for the man in their life with prostate cancer? Stay the course. Don't give up on it. Don't be afraid to ask how they're doing. That used to be a big bugaboo for me. I used to snap at people. But don't be afraid to ask. Be supportive any way you can. You know, support isn't always mental. Sometimes it's physical. I'm no longer able to do yard work and other things because of the lumpars that's affecting my breathing. I hired a damn handyman who's the best guy in the world. I mean, reach out for help if you need it. Oh, oh don't miss an appointment. That's my big one. I've never missed an appointment. Don't miss a damn appointment. Yeah. Always accompany the man to in their lives to those appointments? If he wants to. Yeah, ask. I, right. Yeah, I mean, when my dad was dying, I went to all his appointments. I was there when they said, we've, we've exhausted everything for you. Hmm. Surreal. Surreal. Dad, what are we going to do? We're going to go get a beer. <laughs> my dad was a lot like me. Said, yeah, we're going to go get a beer. We're going to go get a sandwich. We'll figure this out. I mean... And on, a lot of my thoughts on death and dying are are influenced by him. This thing was always, I don't know about an afterlife. I just know there's something else out there and it's my next big adventure. My dad was an adventure guy. So yeah, it's totally changed my thoughts on di- death and dying. It's I'm ready for the next big adventure. Don't need it to happen tomorrow, <laughs> but I am ready for it. <laughs>